Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. I barrowed about, I don't know, at least 30, maybe 40 barrows of dirt and I was pretty hungry. And uh, when I finished, and my wife, because I had bought her this expensive stove for our new house, and uh, last night I'm so glad I bought it because she cooked me such an awesome dinner. I mean, it was just like over the top, you know. And uh, who, who likes a good dinner? Yeah, I think most people here do. Who likes a good lunch? Who likes a good breakfast? I mean, you know, I mean, we just like food, right? Any case, I got something in here that I just thought I'd bring up here just to, um, I don't know, muffin for me. Mm. Who would like to partake with me? Nobody. Who would like to partake with me? I saw one hand over there. Oh, good, good, good catch, Mark. Um. Let's be honest this morning, most people like food. You're just regretting you didn't put your hand up for that muffin, right? Most people like food. And, you know, I spoke on a message in chapel. And normally after I speak in chapel, just about every morning, the people applaud. I don't know why. They just applaud, which I appreciate. There was no applause this morning. I couldn't believe it. I'm just trying to help people, and there's no applause. But, you know... We, we like food. Why do we like food? Well, of course, it tastes good, right? Especially if it's bad for you. It tastes good, right? I mean, food that's good for you doesn't taste so good. But, well, you know what I'm talking about. I think there's a glitch in the matrix. I'm going to talk to God about it when I get to heaven. But, but there's something about food. Yes, it tastes good. And it also satisfies us, right? Hello? It nourishes us. And it strengthens us. And so it should. God designed it to be that way, right? God designed it. There's something about food. If you go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it's a big topic. I mean, right at the beginning, Adam and Eve looked at some food, saw it was good, ate it, and the whole of mankind went into sin. I mean, something over food. Esau sold his birthright for it. Think about it. Covenants were made over a meal. Abraham sat down and ate. He sat down and ate with the angels, with God himself. Feasts were ordained by God in Scripture. Major feasts and minor feasts were ordained by God to come and celebrate, have a big meal together. The Passover lamb was to be completely eaten. And as you know, Jesus instituted the Last Supper. And he's going to herald in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And everybody say, Amen. And so there's something about eating. There's something about coming together, having a muffin together, Charlie. It's called fellowship. It's called communion. If you fast for a long period of time, and I've done a, a number of those, The one thing that you miss after a while, after the first three days, is not the food itself, but is sitting down, eating with somebody. And even if you sit at the family, which I did, while they ate, there is something still missing because you're not partaking with them. There's something spiritual, I believe, in relation to eating with people. It's called breaking of bread. And now I'm spitting out my muffin as I preach. One of the most well-known fasts in the Bible, of course, is found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And I'm talking about fasting this morning, and that's why there was no applause, obviously. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And likewise, let's be honest, afterwards he was hungry. They say hunger, real hunger, sets in after 40 days. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, the devil... If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. This is the first temptation. And he answered and said, It is written, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, the story is repeated in Matthew, and it's in Mark, and in Luke. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Yes, Jesus was led by the Spirit of the wilderness, and after he fasted for 40 days, 
He came out of there in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we spend some time with God, we grow in the power of the Holy Spirit. 40 days, of course, is a long time to fast. They say 40 days is a maximum. After that, you die, basically. And so it's interesting that people, as they go on hunger strikes, as they do in prison and other places, and the world can't get their head around fasting. I know when we were doing some long fast in the church here some years ago, the radio station rang me up, several of them, and they say, why are you on a hunger strike? Now, a hunger strike is different, right? And it's, it's true that in prison, sometimes they die after 10 or 20 days. But a fast, you're being sustained by the Lord, Amen. You're being sustained by God. It's not a hunger strike. It's humbling yourself before God, looking for Him to strengthen you and sustain you, and He does and He will. You know, fasting, Vine's expository of the Greek, simply says this. Fasting is a voluntary abstinence from food. A voluntary abstinence from food. A voluntary, nobody is under legalism to do it. Under rules, you must do this. It's a voluntary abstinence of food. You know, let's be honest. God is probably not calling you to a 40-day fast. And everybody say, praise God for that. There's only three recorded in the Bible, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And let's be honest, they were all heavy hitters and in interesting circumstances. Of course, Moses was up the mountain in the actual presence of God. Elijah was given angel food, and the angels said, go in the strength of this food for 40 days. And of course, Jesus, the Son of God. I know some people have done 40-day fasts. I never have. I've done a couple of 30 days, but not 40 days. But the good news is that you may not be called to fast for 40 days, but the bad news is, is you are called to fast as a Christian. Let's, let, let's read Matthew 6, Jesus speaking. Moreover, what does it say? Can we just say it right with a bit of gusto? Moreover, when you fast, not if, but when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, that's your, your part, you know, it's like an Anglican church, it's your part and my part, right? When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees you secret will reward you openly. When you fast. He repeats it. When you fast. And then he says, God will reward you. There is a reward for fasting. I believe prayers get answered when we fast. I believe that things can change and things happen. And some things won't happen unless we do pray and fast. The scriptures show it. In Matthew 17... There was a multitude of people come around the disciples because there was a young boy with a demonic problem and they tried to cast a demon out and couldn't. And Jesus comes along and they ask him why they couldn't. He talked about faith and so forth. And, uh, but then he also said this. He said, nothing will be impossible for you if you believe. And in verse 21, however, this kind does not go except by prayer and fasting. Now, I want you to note, my friend, that fasting goes with prayer and prayer goes with fasting. There's not much good fasting and not praying. <laughs> Remember Cornelius, the first Gentile to receive the Holy Spirit. Amazing. We mentioned him in relation to his offering, his giving, came before God as a memorial. I mentioned him last week in relation to his prayer life because the Bible says his prayer was heard. But this week, can I just mention him in relation to fasting? Acts 10, verse 30. So Cornelius said, he's talking to Peter, four days ago I was what? Fasting until this hour. And in the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood with me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your offerings are remembered in the sight of God. Notice fasting goes with prayer and prayer goes with fasting. Now I know and I can appreciate that this is not your most exciting subject. You'd much rather I talk about blessing, right? Prosperity. But fasting is in the Bible and we mustn't neglect it. The early church fast, Acts 14. I didn't even get one amen to that. Acts 14, verse 23. 
So when they appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Notice again that fasting goes with prayer. Prayer goes with fasting. We're encouraged to fast in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, that you give yourselves to fasting and to prayer. Prayer goes with fasting. Fasting goes with prayer. You know, when I read the Bible, it's a good thing to do. All the great men of the Bible, be it Daniel, Nehemiah, Ezra, Samuel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, you can go through the list. They all spent their life in a time of prayer and fasting. But interesting, as I read through about early church fathers, and I love the history of the church and, uh, you know, men and women of old that, 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 that paid an amazing price for us. And when I read about them, let me give you a couple of their names uh, that I just read about recently. Polycarp, Jamon, Augustine, Ambrose. It sounds like Ambrosia, doesn't it? It sounds like that dessert, you know. When you start to fast, you think about food all the time, don't you? Basil the Great. You can tell I'm not fasting today, right? Polycarp, uh, sorry, I mentioned him. Basil the Great, Bonhoeffer, Calvin, Bernard of Clerox, Christenom. Some of these I've never mentioned before. I've just mentioned the, 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 the more well-known names. Clement of Alexandria, Clement of Rome, Gregory the Great. Some of the young people need to study these people. V- Venerable Bede. Obviously, you've got the obvious ones like Luther, Tyndale, Fox, Knox, and all those, Wesley. But, but all these people, all this list whom we owe a great debt. They all lived lives of prayer and fasting. When I read about them, they knew the cost of discipleship. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, there is a a cost to discipleship, right? Thank you for that lousy amen. It's called a disciplined life. The thing is, is that these men, I know a lot of them lived very austere lives. A lot of them lived in monasteries. A lot of them lived in prisons. A lot of them lived in caves. The most recent on that list that I read out, and I put one in there which lived in more our time than these other times. Some of them go back to, you know, 200 AD and so forth. But, uh, and, I, and I don't pronounce the name correctly, and I apologize for that. But Dietrich Bonhoeffen came from Germany. He was born in 1906, just recently. And the, the most recent person on that list for a long time. But he was executed by, by hanging in 1945 after being in prison and tortured by the Gestapo. He wrote a book called Nash for Lotch. And again, I would, if you're German, you just laugh right now as I mispronounce that badly. But the literal word for it means following. And he made, and I found it interesting, that even back then, he, especially with the world it is today, he makes a sharp distinction between cheap grace and costly grace. He said this, cheap grace is the enemy of the church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace is a preaching of forgiveness without repentance, without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Costly grace is a hidden treasure in the field that for the sake of it, a man will gladly go sell all that he has to obtain it. I get one amen on the front row. I mean, a lot of people today just want the comfort and the ease of it all, but Jesus said, take up your cross daily, right? And so there's some discipline and some fasting that needs to happen in your, in, your, in your world. And so today we have a Christian life for many people without a life of prayer, without a life of devotion, without a life of being challenged to fast. I know you can go to churches and never be challenged to read your word, but not at City Impact Church, right? I mean, whether you read or not is up to you, but you will be challenged to read your Bible because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You will be challenged to pray. Hallelujah. My house will be a house of prayer and even occasionally challenged to fast. And so to have a Christian life without a life of prayer and fasting and daily devotion, it ought not to be that way. And ladies, I don't want you to feel left out because one of the greatest fasts in the Bible was called by a lady by the name of Esther. Many of you will know that, but she called the whole nation to fast. Let's have a look at Esther 4 verse 13. You know the story, Haman was going to get all the Jews executed and annihilated. And Mordecai, her uncle, told uh, to answer Esther, the queen, do not think uh, in your heart that you will escape the king in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. There's a message right there. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. God will always raise up somebody. 
Hallelujah. To bring about his deliverance. Amen. And, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet, one of the greatest verses in the Bible right here. Who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That's an amazing verse. You've heard it before. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shashan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai, imagine being married and not being able to see your husband. It was just a thought. I mean, I just, I wouldn't want to have it, babe, but I'm just thinking about it here. Just new doctrine and all, you know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. People get all serious. Okay, all right. I'd call for you, babe. I'd say, come away with my beloved. So Mordecai, I've just been reading the Song of Solomon. Who, who's read the Song of Solomon? Of course, most Bible great theologians would talk about the, the, the bride of Christ and, and Christ and so forth, that intimate relationship. But it is an interesting book, isn't it? <laughs> Talks about twin gazelles and all kinds of things. Your neck is as ivory. Any case. It's in the Bible, darling. Should be X-rated, that's what I say. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Now, this was a heavy duty fast. Three days, not only not eating, but drinking. And um, I guess desperate times calls for desperate measures. You can last 40 days without food, but you can only last three days without water. And I've said it before, I, I, I have only done one of those kind of fasts, and I don't intend doing another unless God calls me to it. But, you know, it's one thing. You think you get hungry after a day or two, you, you go without water for the day. I tell you, you just want to brush your teeth. You just want to have something in your mouth. I'm serious. Now, I know... Um, I'm not suggesting you do it. I'm just saying they did here. And the three-day fast, by the way, is the most common one in the Bible. Now, you probably heard of the term Daniel fast. Who's heard of that? It's a Christian cliche kind of deal. It's like cutting out certain foods. And uh, maybe even some people cut out watching television or cut out reading the newspaper or whatever. Daniel never called it fasting, and the Bible doesn't either. It's just abstaining from certain foods. It's better than nothing, but it's like an eating plan. It's just, you know, like going to Jenny Craig. <laughs> or, you know, you know, some diet, I don't know. But as a discipline is good and it's involved, but you're not leaning on God to sustain you. Sustain you. In the Bible, there's one meal fast. There's one day fast. There's three-day fast, 10-day fast, 40-day fast, and then there's just fast for however long you decide to do. But can I encourage you to have a goal? Because if you don't have a goal, you won't last that long. (laughs) The key, of course, is to do something. Now, can I just talk practically for a moment? Of course, when you fast, go without food, you're going to get hungry. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, I can do that. And guess what? By morning tea time... They're bringing out the cream cake. You're going to get hungry, particularly for the first three days. A three-day fast is one of the hardest because you're hungry all the time. You feel like your throat is cut, but the good news is you won't die. And like anything, the more regularly you fast, the easier it is. Now, I want to give you some advice this morning. And I have to confess, in the advice that I'm about to give you, I'm better at telling you than doing it. I'm not talking about fasting itself. I'm talking about during the fast, practically you should drink lots of water. I'm not good at drinking lots of water. I don't drink water during the day. I might have one glass. My wife is pushing it back the whole time. Anybody think she's a waterholic? (laughs) And I know we've got to keep the supermarkets running with all that bottled water and all that kind of stuff, but the thing is, is that I don't see any point in pushing water into your body when you're not thirsty. But they say it's healthy for you, so good on you. Keep it up. I just don't, and I can't afford the time in the bathroom all day. (laughs) But when you're fasting, drink plenty of fluids. Now, some people drink orange juice. 
Some people drink coffee. These days, I, to be honest, I, I still have the odd coffee uh, while I'm fasting. It's not probably good for you. You shouldn't do it. I used to just do purist fast because I was a purist. Some people drink milkshakes. Some people drink whatever goes through the blender. <laughs> you know it to be true, right? Now, you may feel lightheaded when you fast. And if you've got health issues, please, <laughs> I could put the disclaimer in, please see your doctor first. But in any case, fasting is healthy for your body. Most medical journals will tell you that. If you have or had an eating disorder, please, you need to be in consultation with a pastor because we don't want anybody to end up with eating disorders. I know when I've done long fasts, it's very hard to start eating again. You've got to force yourself to eat. And if you're working physical, I have to say it's not as easy as it is for those who got an office job. I mean, when you're working physically like I was yesterday, you get hungry, right? You'll sell your birthright for a meal. That's what Esau did. But it amazes me, it is true, because sometimes we can make the excuse, because in the book of Acts, they fasted and sailors worked hard in those days. The apostle Paul said, you haven't eaten anything for 14 days. You've been fasting. Eat some bread for your survival. And so you can still partake. Now, I know that fasting three days, of course, when you're physically working, can be pretty hard. And I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying that you need to be doing something. Cut out the cream donuts for morning tea. Just joking. Practically, and again, I'm better at giving this advice than doing it. Practically, you should cut down on your food and take a day or two before. Now, we've got a fast coming up. That's why I'm talking about it. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, accumulating with a prayer, because prayer and fasting go together, prayer on Friday night from 8 p.m. till 10 p.m. We do this four times a year, right? So you should be cutting down to fast three days, Monday, Tuesday. To me, I just don't see the point. <laughs> I mean, apart from, and we've got some doctors here, and obviously medically it's better if you cut down and eat lighter meals before you fast. But most of us are, are too fleshly for that. And likewise, when you come off a longer fast, and again, I speak from experience and the pain of experience. <laughs> Don't break those fasts with fish and chips. You should come off a long fast slowly, eat lots of prunes. I have paid the price many times. <laughs> it's just that once you start eating, you eat anything in sight. Who knows what I'm talking about? Come on, be honest with me. I'm not the only unholy person here. Now, if you've never fasted before, you possibly can't do a full three-day fast. But every one of us can do something. Maybe it's a meal a day, maybe two meals a day, maybe three meals a day for one day, but many here could do a three-day fast. Now, I'm sure not too many people enjoy fasting. I understand that. And I'm not sure whether the great apostle Paul even enjoyed fasting. He lists it with other un unpleasant circumstances. Let's have a look in verse 3. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, imprisonments, in turmoils, in labors, in sleepiness, in fasting. So he puts fasting with all those unpleasant experiences, but the apostle Paul would have fasted many, many times, sometimes, of course, involuntary, when he was in prison. Uh, who would want to eat the food back then? Uh, you know, let's be honest. But the thing is, when you read the Apostle Paul's letters, like the letter to Ephesians, even though he's writing from a dark dungeon, uh, they, they, they look like the light of heaven. And you know, when he's writing from that musty, dirty, dingy prison, you could sense the breezes of Calvary upon the pages that he wrote. Fasting, can I just say to you, if you're prepared to fast, particularly over a longer period, three days or whatever, you will find your mind clearer. You might even sleep less after 10 days, which is good. 
You're not as sleepy. You'll feel better. You may have an empty tummy feeling after three days. You'll be hungry for three days, but then you'll just be a little empty, but you won't be hungry. The real hunger kicks in after 40 days, as I mentioned, and that's a medical fact. But Hebrews 4 verse 14, let's have a look. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Now, what was the first temptation when he was fasting? Turn those stones into bread. He understands. You know, every time I've been determined to go on a long fast, every, I can, in fact, it was so funny. I walk around children's church every Sunday just to say hello to the workers. And, and this morning, because I told the story this morning, and the person who, who offered me one, wasn't in the service this morning, but they offered me some chocolate. Not that I was fasting today, but it was humorous because I often tell the story, and, and this kind of thing happens all the time. One time I was determined to do a long fast, and I walked into North Cross Dairy to buy uh, some, something for somebody, and the thing was, was that as I walked in, they were giving away at North Cross Dairy, never seen it before, never seen it since, free chocolate peanut slabs. Now, I'm serious. As a younger person, I'm talking about my teenage years, I had a bit of a fetish for chocolate peanut slabs. I can't afford that today, but not financially, just the calorie-wise. You know what I'm talking about? But the thing was, they're giving away free ones. It was like, get behind me, devil. So what did I do? I took it for later. (laughs) Up here's for thinking. And so Jesus was tempted, and you'll be tempted. As soon as you go on a fast, you know, somebody comes along with morning tea at work, you know, with your favorite cake. Who knows what I'm talking about? Anybody here had that happen to them? (laughs) Sounds like it. (laughs) Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help in time of need. You know the word fast basically means to make secure, to be safe, to be firm. There's something about fasting that grow, you grow spiritually. You become more firmer in your faith. You get more secure in your faith. You know, in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the Apostle Paul says, Watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Philippians 1, 27, that you stand fast. And of course, your motive has got to be right and fasting. You're not doing it out of legalism. You're not doing it because you have to. You're doing it because you love God. You desire more of Him. You desire His kingdom to be evident in your life. Amen. That you may stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, when we fast collectively, because I know many of you fast during the year individually, and God bless you, and so you should. But there's something about coming together, praying together, fasting together. Amen. It's encouraging to know, you know, uh, you know, because you're not the only one in the boat, right? You're not the only one suffering. All right. Throughout Paul's letter. Told you it goes quiet when I talk about this. I'll be back to blessing next week, all right? He encourages the church not only to fast, but to stand fast, hold fast. Hold fast to our confession, hold fast to our faith, hold fast to our boldness, hold fast to our confidence, hold fast to our hope, and hold fast to that which is good. Look at it now, 2 Thessalonians, and I'm nearly through. Therefore, brethren, listening on live stream, stand fast. And hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God, our Father, who loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope, by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Hold fast to the traditions. What traditions is he talking about? Well, one of the big ones, the big block, is about food. Is about food. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I received from the Lord, in which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do 
as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, communion really is not just a little piece of bread and a little drink. I know the church has symbolized that down through the years just for convenience sake. But really it's coming together for a meal, for a meal. You know, in the book of Exodus, Exodus 29, chapter 29, the lamb was slain in morning and at night, seven days a week. It was slain as a continual offering. Christ, our Passover lamb, offered himself once for all. That one offering became a continual offering because he lives forever before the throne of God interceding for you and I. But it also teaches us that we too need to come daily to offer up spiritual sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices of prayer, spiritual sacrifices of pr praise, and spiritual sacrifices of fasting. And so as we partake of the spiritual bread that we'll be doing in a moment as we come around the emblems of communion, preparing us for the week ahead, because these emblems, I believe, will sustain us and bless and strengthen our lives. Listen now, listen, listen as I close before we hand these emblems out. We know that natural bread sustains the body. The Old Testament talks about it being the staff of life. But the spiritual bread, I am the living bread, Jesus said, that came down from heaven, sustains the soul and the spirit. Listen, without the natural bread, without the natural bread, you will die. I'm talking about food. A lot of people have gone off bread, but in any case, we won't go there. I'm just talking about natural food. You'll die physically. But without the spiritual bread, you will die spiritually. The Word of God, these emblems, Jesus is the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. These emblems sustain us today. And can I just encourage you, do not live in famine. All of us We've seen famines overseas. We've seen famines of malnourished children, crying, hungry, skinny. And I don't want to live in a famine spiritually. We don't live in a country with famine naturally and praise God for that. But let's not turn the blessing into a curse. Let's not live in a famine spiritually. I don't want to have my soul in famine. I want to partake of the divine bread of heaven represented in these emblems today. Hebrews 10:23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I'm endeavoring to stir you up. I know fasting's not the greatest, most, um, you know, happiest thing to do. If I can use that word, I'll take the greatest out. But it's not the most pleasant thing to do. But I want to stir you up. I want to stir you up. I want to encourage you. Not even to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Next Friday night, let us come together to pray and to believe God for our nation and the East Campus and global impact and stir up each other as a manner of some, but exhorting one another. Look at it so much more as you see the day approaching. What's the day? It's about the day of atonement. There's more to fasting about the day of atonement, about the coming of the King than any other topic in the Bible. I want to tell you right now, hallelujah, the King is coming and we must prepare ourselves. You know, Revelation 2.25, it says, Jesus said, hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come. There's a time when the Lord comes, hallelujah. But there is a time where we must come to Him. There's a time when He will come. But until then, we must come to Him. Listen, friend, this week we have an opportunity to gather to pray and fast and to believe God for blessing over your life, over my life, over the life of the church, over our nation. Amen. Let's not let this opportunity go by. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart, but say, God, here I am. Send me. And so we're going to come around these emblems as they're dispersed now among us. We're going to worship God. And can I encourage you to determine in your heart this week, what will you do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Now listen, some of you may have a wedding on Thursday. Things happen during the week these days. So you may want to fast Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. I don't know. I'm not being legalist. I'm try trying to help us as a church. Because things don't happen unless we pray and fast. Amen. And uh, we're not doing anything that's unusual, anything that's strange, anything we haven't done before. And I want to encourage the young people, particularly today, to live a life of discipline, discipleship. That's what it's about. Don't have the cheap grace that's sweeping around the globe. 
but pay a price that I believe Jesus, as Josh said so well, he gave his best. We must give our best to God as well. And so as we know the true treasure is heaven, let's give our all for it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wonderful Jesus.